In this episode, we take a detour from our current Lewis and Clark trail trip in order to visit western North Dakota, namely Theodore Roosevelt National Park, also known as the North Dakota Badlands, the Enchanted Highway, and the town of Medora, among other things. Then we'll retake the trail at the confluence of the Yellowstone River with the Missouri. So yes, the adventure continues! I'm free in my RV. Yeah. The problem with tire pressure was detected. Probably because it's kind of cold this morning. Mm -hmm. It is actually now 66, but it was in the 50s. Anyways, uh, our first uh, item of the day today is an RV wash because Mini Tini 3 still filthy from all those dirt roads we took a couple of days ago. So that's what we're gonna do first. And uh, hopefully this thing will someday tell me what's wrong with my tire. Oh, try again. There you go. I mean, they look fine at first sight, so it should be fine. Came to the wash barn in Mandan, but the outside RV bay doesn't seem to be working, so we continue. And we're going to be driving west on I-94 for about 130 miles. It should be less than two hours in total, but you know we're gonna be stopping here and there because that's the way. We've been on the Lewis and Clark Trail now for a month, and to be honest, I feel like taking a break. So instead of hugging the shore of Lake Sakakawea all the way to Williston, we're going to revisit the North Dakota Badlands. I was there back in 2020, but Illy has never been. Besides, the experience is always different. Let's stop here to take a quick break. This is called Sweet Briar Lake. By the way, I do believe there is supposed to be free boondocking somewhere on the other side. At least there used to be. If you see me swerving a little bit, it's not because I'm drunk or distracted. It is just really windy today, which makes for a white knuckle drive. You see that hill up on the left? That's where we're going next. And what do you know? It's a huge cow. It doesn't get much better than this, does it? At least when it comes to roadside attractions. The attraction is technically free, but they do accept donations in order to maintain the cow. And there it is. It is called Salem Sioux, and it is the world's largest Holstein cow. She is also the largest of North Dakota's large animals, even larger than the buffalo in Jamestown. Oops, I did it again. There's barely enough room to turn around. It's the world's largest Holstein cow. Salem Sioux, let's, let's go check it out. The talking trail, let's go up. Let's go to the top. Commanding view. Sue was built in 1974, 38 feet high, 50 feet long, 6 tons of reinforced fiberglass. So windy, so windy today. Let's go all the way to the top. There is one glorious view of the North Dakota prairie. No, 
those are very heavy winds coming from the west. Incredible. I had definitely heard of the of the North Dakota winds, but oh look, petroglyphs. I can see our next point of interest in the distance, and this one is going to be more like a detour, or a spur if you will, we're going to drive the Enchanted Highway. Well, this right here, this marks the beginning of the Enchanted Highway. Of course, last year, no, in 2020, in 2020, I did the Enchanted Highway. I did it backwards, so this was the end. And uh, today, we're not gonna do the whole thing again, but we might go like to the to the second of the of the sculptures just to just to see it. But uh, I mean, this is an iconic landmark here as you're coming on I-94, coming west. You get to see this. It's very cool. It's also very windy, so we're gonna continue. The Enchanted Highway is a 32-mile stretch of road between the Gladstone exit here on I-94 and a small town called Regent. And along this road, we will encounter the world's largest collection of scrap metal sculptures. The first one we saw is called Geese in Flight, and it was recognized in 2002 as the world's largest scrap metal sculpture by the Guinness Book of World Records. This next sculpture is called Deer Crossing from 2002. And as we're getting farther south, with one exception I think, we'll be seeing older and older sculptures. The artist, Gary Griff, started the project at Regent at the other end of the road, his hometown, back in 1989, and worked his way north to I-94. I actually met him briefly when I was here in 2020. This one is called Grasshoppers on the Field from 1999. This one is called Fisherman's Dream. I believe it may be the newest one from 2006 and perhaps the most elaborate one. I'm sorry to say this one has seen better days. Perhaps there was a storm or something that damaged it because it looked much better back in 2020. Oh well, this is kind of sad. I hope they get to repair it. There they are. The first time I saw them, I called them the creepy birds. But the sculpture is actually called Pheasants on the Prairie from 1996. I mean, don't you think they look kind of creepy? I don't know, there is something about oversized birds that kind of gives me the heebie-jeebies, but maybe that's just me. This one is called Theodore Roosevelt Rides Again. Roosevelt, of course, our 26th president, spent a good amount of time at his Elkton Ranch here in North Dakota, nowadays part of the national park that bears his name. Here we have Ten Family from 1991. It may look like the crudest of them all, but hey, it was one of the first ones. And this one even has hair. We 
we're reaching the end of our journey on the Enchanted Highway as we arrive at Regent, North Dakota. Here on the left, we have the Enchanted Highway gift shop with another piece that actually moves. Let's go all the way to the end where we will encounter the Enchanted Castle and this unnamed sculpture of a knight fighting a dragon. The Enchanted Castle is actually a hotel, but we're not gonna go inside. Last time I was here also, the dragon seemed to be in a little better shape, but it looks like they may be restoring it and repairing it. Well, we've made it to the Enchanted Castle here. The famous structure at the end of the Enchanted Highway. We decided to do the whole thing after all. And here we have this final sculpture. And I must say, I mean, most of them are holding up pretty well, but particularly this one and the fisherman's dream are not holding up so well. I mean, it definitely needs a fresh coat of paint and uh, maybe some maintenance. I don't know what's going on, but it, it would be sad to see a roadside attraction landmark like this one wither away this way. I was gonna go by the by the gift shop, but uh, we kind of want to get to our campground in Medora, so we're gonna head there now, pretty much non-stop, and then get something to eat. Yeah, the Badlands await. Let's see if this, if this still works. It's called Whirly Gigs. It does. We're back on I-94, the landscape about to change dramatically. Keep your eyes peeled. Right here on the right, we're about to get a sneak peek. This is called the Painted Canyon Visitor Center. It is also a rest area on I-94 with a scenic overlook where we're going to get our first view of the Badlands. An unequivocal sign we have arrived to the American West. Raindrops keep falling on my lens, but here we are. I just wanted to share this view with you. I just did a Pelican head update and of course now it started raining, but we've made it finally to the south unit of Theodore Roosevelt National Park, the North Dakota Badlands. And now we're gonna go check into the campground and, and all that. And tomorrow we'll explore the park. By the way, the first time I saw this, uh, I almost got emotional because it, had, it, it meant that we had finally made it to the west. As you know, I love the West. We're getting wet, we're gonna get sick. Let's go to the campground. It 
It figures it starts raining when we get to the most beautiful part. Here we are, arriving in Medora, North Dakota, the gateway to the Badlands, and a pretty cool town, touristy but cool, lots of things to do. We're staying right here at the Red Trail Campground. As much as I like the idea of being one with nature and disconnecting from the outside world, let's face it, nowadays we need the internet for almost everything. And campground Wi-Fi can be unreliable at best. At worst, it can actually be dangerous. That's why it is my, my measure of last resort. You know, first I check if there is cell phone signal. Second, if there's nothing, well, I'll try Starlink. But what happens if you're in a wooded campground in the middle of nowhere? Well, you're gonna have to connect to that potentially insecure Wi-Fi. And that's where a VPN becomes essential, something crucial to have. And, and Surfshark VPN is our sponsor for this episode. VPN, it stands for Virtual Private Network. Work. And what it does, it creates a private, secure connection between your devices and the internet, so no one can be eavesdropping on that con connection and potentially, you know, hacking your computer, stealing your passwords, uh, your pictures, who knows? So that's its primary function, its main function, but it has other features. My favorite you, is that you can change your location virtually. Let's say, for example, that there, there is some type of content that is unavailable at your current location, but it's available in a different country. Well, there's a menu, you select the country, you select the city, and that's all you have to do. As far as the internet is concerned, you're in that other country in that remote location. There are other features. It has this clean web feature that will get rid of unwanted ads or spyware, that kind of thing. It has a true incognito search for your eyes only. Now, if you want to take advantage of all this, I have a special deal for you guys. You go to surfshark.deals slash myrv and you enter promo code myrv at checkout and you get 85% off and three months for free. Now back to Medora, which actually has very good cell phone signal. Our site is naturally in front of the dump station, but I believe it was the last full hookup site they had available when we made the reservation a couple of days ago. And that's how you dump a cassette toilet. Oh joy. Downtown is kind of walking distance, but we're gonna drive, just in case it rains again. Little Missouri Saloon, that looks pretty nice. Something smells good. Yeah, the Little Missouri Saloon seems pretty lively, so that's where we're going to eat. Ooh, look at that. It looks like a real Old West Saloon. Even the door handles are handguns. Lots of cowboy hats and dollar bills. It certainly feels like the West. Look at that view of the Badlands. Let me tell you, good food, good beer, and great views. Let's go for a stroll, walk off our late lunch, early dinner. The main attraction here in town seems to be the Medora Musical. Even though we've got tickets for tomorrow, we want to stop by and see what it is like. 
Before the musical, they offer a buffet-style meal called the Pitchfork Steak Fondue, which is what it sounds like. They cook steaks on pitchforks. Well, this is the famous amphitheater where they do the Medora musical, and we have tickets for tomorrow, so... I don't think they allow me to take video, but I'll take pictures. This is, by the way, called the Burning Hills Amphitheater. And I like the touch with the Medora sign on the hill, a la Hollywood. Really looking forward to this. What a beautiful place this is. Tomorrow, we're going to explore the Badlands. Sorry. I think we've neglected Minitini 3's sticker map for way too long, so let's update it. We've got Kansas. Nebraska. South Dakota. And finally, North Dakota. There. Well, good morning. It is a beautiful day in Medora, and uh, well, let's go to Theodore Roosevelt National Park. Here we are. This is the entrance, right here by Chimney Park. There was Teddy Roosevelt's cabin back there by the visitor center. Maybe we'll stop by on the way back. And here's our first overlook. The first of many. This one is called the Medora Overlook, and as the name implies, it overlooks the town. Except for the fact that you can't really see much of the town. There's another RV park down there. I think that's where they do the pitchfork fondue. North Dakota Badlands are not to be confused with Badlands National Park in South Dakota. They are actually very different, although kind of part of the same geological process. These are much greener, as we can see. We do plan to visit the other Badlands later on this trip. Hello, little fellas. It's a prairie dog town. They were first described by Lewis and Clark in Nebraska a suspicious new to science on September 7th, 1804. So there, that's your Lewis and Clark reference even on this detour episode. They are actually more related to squirrels than dogs, of course, and they are herbivore. And they live in these very elaborate underground cities. They look so cute when they're standing up, almost like Timon the meerkat. Aren't you too close to the road? As it's been kind of the recurring theme during this part of the trip, we were also here back in 2020, so I would encourage you to watch that video as well, because the experience is always different. This overlook doesn't really have a name, but I would call it the I-94 Overlook. Actually, it is quite an amazing view. A few hundred feet down the road and we have the Skyline Vista. 
and it looks like they are repaving and repainting all the parking lots. Alright, let's do the short 5 minute trail. I am so excited to be seeing this kind of terrain again. You know, I love the mountains and I love the desert, or any combination of those two. And while this is perhaps too green to be called a desert, the air feels drier. And there are lumps and protuberances on the ground, and, and I like seeing that. There's I-94 once again, the northernmost east-west interstate in these parts. Montana barely 30 miles to the west. But tomorrow, we're taking a different route towards the Big Sky State. You'll see. It is impossible for me to get tired of these views, but the show must go on. Let's immerse ourselves a little more into these badlands. Here on the left, Cottonwood Campground, which was closed when I was here in 2020, so let's check it out real quick. It seems to be half empty today on a Wednesday, and it is completely primitive, but hey, you're inside the park boondocking, with no cell phone signal. So, if you plan on spending a lot of time at your campsite, with more privacy and elbow room, away from all the distractions of modern civilization, then this is for you. Now, Red Trail in Medora is just 50 minutes away with full hookups on one of the fastest cellular networks in the country, so maybe next time I'll do both and compare. How about that? Maybe if they invent a Starlink that can go through trees? As of 2022, there is still a section of the Scenic Loop Drive that it is closed, so let's make a left here onto the East River Road. Here they have a trailhead, and this is called Peaceful Valley Ranch. And the last time I was here, it was full of bison. I guess the bison are somewhere else today. By the way, this episode is one of the few left in which we are traveling with the Colorado, and as good as its replacement is going to be, I do miss that turning radius. I do find it curious we haven't seen any bison, or any other wildlife for that matter, except for the cute prairie dogs. Speaking of prairie dogs, here's another town. Here's what it looks like underground. Let me tell you, these animals are amazing. Let's take a break, stretch our legs. But I am really puzzled that we haven't seen any bison, any bison at all whatsoever. Hmm. Mating season, perhaps? I don't know. Let's lose a short little trail here and then look at that. That's, that's awesome.
Look at this. It's. Uh, I think I said it before. It's kind of hard to believe. Some of these are are not man-made, you know. What forces of nature could create this? I'm pretty sure. Um, maybe I should not get off trail, but I'm pretty sure there's a view on the other side of this little ridge here. Oh yeah, look at that. The trail keeps going, but this is as far as we're going today. I have another short trail in mind, a little farther down the road. We're gonna stop here and we're gonna do the Wind Canyon Trail. Less than half a mile, 15 minutes, should be easy. And if you recall, we did this in, back in 2020. But this kind of stuff never gets old. And just in case you never saw that 2020 video, you know, why not? Let's do, let's do it all over again. And uh, if I recall, the views of the little Missouri River down there are pretty spectacular. Oh yeah. What an amazing view. Well, let's continue going up. I think that would be the highest point in the whole trail. So, I mean, it's, half a, it's less than half a mile, but there's a little bit of an elevation gain, which I don't mind. Can use the exercise, actually. It's such a perfect weather day. I mean, now that the sun is, you know, starting to, to be a little stronger, starting to get a little warm, but it's still the air temperature has to be in the, in the low 70s. Very pleasant. Do those look like naturally occurring rocks to you? They kind of look man-made to me. We keep going up and up, and here we have those strange looking rocks again. This is it. It is one of those trails where the effort to reward ratio is actually great. Just half a mile, relatively easy, a little bit of elevation gain, but not much. All that for these amazing views of the little Missouri River. It's amazing how you, you know, just, just walking a little bit like this half a mile we're walking, slowly changes the, the perspective completely. My question still is, where are the bison? Or buffer, as they're also called around here. I don't know. And we're almost at the summit.
slowly gaining elevation through this greener area. It almost feels like we're not in the Badlands anymore. Almost. Until it does. Let's stop here at the Boy Court Overlook. Ooh, what a view! Now this is the Boy Court Overlook Trail, which is one that we are going to do. It is another pretty easy hike, but let me tell you, very, very rewarding. Oh, look at that! And I just love the contrast. The juxtaposition of the bright green vegetation and the barren rock. This is such an unreal terrain. And that is the end of the trail over there. At least, the end of the easy part. The one we're going to do. Hmm, there seems to be another trail. I'd be curious to find out how to get there. This is just so spectacular, no matter which way you look. There they are again. It does not look like they are on a trail though. Regardless, I would love to get down there and do some exploring. That is just truly, truly amazing. Oh, what a spectacular view this is. I mean, the, the, the camera doesn't really capture what your eyes really uh, get to see, you know, the depth perception and uh, we have all these incredible rock formations over here and then the prairies down there. It's, uh, it's quite a sight to see, I mean, it's amazing. And then down here we have all this, it's like white sand. There's people hiking down there, which is, uh, I'd be curious to know, uh, you know, where the trailhead is and what, what part of what trail that is. It doesn't look like a trail, it looks like they're going off trail, but I'd be curious to know just so. So we can do it someday, next time. Hey, we're gonna head back to the car and continue on the loop road and maybe we'll get to see some bison at some point. <laughs> They've been quite elusive today. You just can't get tired of these magnificent views. And over there too, I mean. <laughs> Are those bison I see? Yes, they are. Finally, they decide to show up.
Here's a good spot for a potty break and uh, to admire these incredible rock formations. We're reaching the end of the drivable road. And this is it. This is as far as we can go. This one is called the Badlands Overlook. And I think it is a fitting end to the drive. Now from here, we're gonna turn around and maybe stop at some of the places we missed along the way, such as Buck Hill, which is one of the highest points in the park. Check it out! Bison alert! And it is by the old entrance to the park. And here we are. Look what we have there. Oh, it's leaving. No. Oh, there's more than one. And I think they are coming back. Oh no, they're coming this way. Definitely coming this way. Let me get inside the car. And it is gone. Uh oh, I think we've got a dead battery. And there's another bison right there. I'm gonna have to wait. Alright, let's take out the good old trusty NOCO battery booster and see if we can get it started. Well, to make a long story short, the trusty old NOCO booster apparently reached the end of its useful life because it didn't work. Luckily, someone stopped to help us. They had a newer booster which didn't work either, and eventually we had to do it the old-fashioned way. This only means that now I'm not gonna be able to stop this engine until we get to a battery shop, which means not being able to stop at any of the other points of interest in the park. That is a big bummer, but at least we got to see some bison. Now the closest battery shop we could find is Walmer Supercenter in Dickinson, almost 40 miles east of Medora, which means the rest of our day is going to be invested in that. And then tonight we have the Medora musical.
we've got ourselves a wildlife jam. Ooh, check it out, wild horses. Well, at least we got one last wildlife sighting as a consolation prize. Now I won't bore you with the details, suffice to say our battery was fine, and to this day it is a mystery what really happened. Now let's go see the Medora musical. At the beginning we didn't know, but yes, it is all part of the show. And needless to say, video wasn't allowed, but I took plenty of pictures. It was an excellent show, well performed, well choreographed and very varied. It basically tells the story of Medora. Teddy Roosevelt, of course, takes a protagonist role throughout the whole thing. There he is, speaking to the townspeople, and dancing, and singing. But it wasn't only about that. There's even a great ventriloquist in the middle. The second act is much more patriotic, honoring and retelling the story of the Rough Riders during the Spanish-American War in which Roosevelt took part. It also gets a lot more elaborate with the reenactment. Towards the end, it is actually very moving, as a gentleman on horseback appears in the background carrying the American flag. It was a good show. I recommend it. Well, good morning on the road again, and today uh, we're gonna sort of retake that Lewis and Clark route. Uh, but first, we're gonna go to the north unit of Theodore Roosevelt National Park, and uh, we're gonna skip one of the Lewis and Clark sites. That's Lewis and Clark State Park here in North Dakota, which is the place where Lewis uh, Meriwether Lewis got accidentally shot, but that was on the way back. So, uh, in any case. We're gonna skip that in lieu of doing the the north unit of Teddy Roosevelt National Park, which I think is, is gonna be more scenic. And then driving to the west into the sunset, I'm telling you. This was a nice RV park, somewhat utilitarian, but impeccably located here in Medora. I mean, we could walk into town if we really wanted to. And uh, that's what's important, everything works. It's fine. Beautiful setting, especially these sites back here with the mountain on the right. All right, away we go. Saying goodbye to the South Unit. But take a look at that unique landscape. Theodore Roosevelt National Park is divided into two main units, north and south, and they don't interconnect with each other. In order to get to the north unit, we must drive a little over an hour on US 85. There is also Teddy Roosevelt's Elkhorn Ranch, but I did that in 2020 and while it is a pleasant hike, there's really not a whole lot left at the site. Surrounding the park, we also have the Little Missouri National Grassland, which is very scenic in its own right, but this road isn't so much. Until eventually it does get scenic, as we approach the north units of the park. Here we go, scenic area. Let's stop. I have a feeling there will be better ones, but this is not bad. Here 
Here we are at the North Unit, which we're only gonna do the 14 mile scenic drive, and we might do one short hike along the way. I was saying, what a unique place, and I'm not sure yet which one I like better, whether it is the North Unit, the South Unit, what do you think? Check out all the bison grazing on the hill. There's a lot of construction going on, and this one I was really looking forward to seeing again. The cannonball concretions, but I guess it wasn't meant to be. Another time, perhaps. Let's take a little break and do a short trail. Well, kind of bummed out that they closed down the cannonballs uh, area, but here we have the River Bend Overlook, and this is probably the only uh, short trail we're gonna do here at the North uh, Unit. Uh, we're gonna see if we can stop at the end of the road and have a quick lunch, and then continue towards Williston and then into Montana. It's beautiful out here, beautiful. I don't think I really realized it when I came here back in 2020. But I think I like the North Unit better than the South Unit now, which was not the case back then. Take a look at this. <laughs> and then that gray looks like kind of like a lava field down there and all the different colors. Yeah. Let's check out the shelter, which is historic. That was a nice little break. Now let's continue. I mean, I just can't get over those views. That's amazing.
This is the end of the road, and we wanted to have lunch here, but the parking spaces are too narrow to open up the slide, so we're just gonna enjoy the scenery and have lunch somewhere else, probably outside the park. This is pretty much it for the North Dakota Badlands and our three-day detour from the Lewis and Clark Trail. And the bison are still grazing on the hill. We were able to find a pullout on US 85 where we had a quick lunch with a view. Some garbanzo beans. Well, this wasn't very level, but perfect spot for a quick lunch. It's kind of noisy too. After a quick stop in Williston for fuel and a car wash, we continued the route west and rejoined the Lewis and Clark Trail at the confluence of the Yellowstone with the Missouri and eventually experienced our first western sunset of this trip. But more about that on the next episode. Until then, thank you so much for watching and see you on the road.